So thank you very much, Louise, and hi, everybody. And hope you're all doing well and um, you're getting back to work and maybe you're listening to this in your lunch hour. So I'll try and um, be on the on the point. I've just come back from a mask fit testing course today. Three hours of great fun. Um, and so I'd like to have some fun talking about whitening and tooth wear. This is a new lecture um, because this is a new concept. Because in the beginning, when we did tooth whitening, we used to say that whitening was not... Um, if patients have severe tooth wear, then they shouldn't do whitening, but it's all changed now. So I want to present that to you today. Please look on my um, Greenwall Dental Instagram. If we, last week we ran out of time to answer all the questions. There were a lot of questions about sensitivity. So we'll talk a little bit about that today and managing sensitivity. So what we're talking about today is um, treating whitening, doing whitening and tooth wear and looking at new minimal invasive treatments and how we manage patients with severe tooth erosion in a minimal invasive way. And also when is the best time to do a whitening? Should you do it with this type of massive erosion that you can see on this photograph? Or should you stabilize um, the occlusion and stabilize with composite bonding and then do the whitening? And then is it worth doing the whitening? So let's just have a look at the situation. Um, so I want to talk about minimal invasive dentistry because the technique that I'm going to present to you today is a technique where you absolutely don't even do any drilling. It's minimal invasive adhesive dentistry, um, treating patients with advanced tooth wear using a modified three-step technique. So we've done a lot of interventive dentistry and mechanical dentistry, filling holes, etc. That's what we do. And now I want to present to you minimal invasive aesthetic dentistry. So tooth whitening is a non-AGP. And now that we are returning back to work, and triaging our emergencies, the next stage will be doing other non-AGP treatments, which are tooth whitening. And um, I want to look at a concept called chemical therapeutics, where we use the tooth whitening tray and we um, make that as, as a therapeutic tray. The tooth whitening products have got a lot of benefits, especially carbamide peroxide. So we place in um, for patients with inflamed gingiva now during the COVID time. They may not have been looking after their teeth as well. Their gums are inflamed. And we use the bleaching tray as a therapeutic tray and we deliver different substances in the tray depending on what is needed. So we would use whitening gel or we would use um, tooth mousse depending on the patient's situation. So that becomes chemical therapeutics and um, therapeutic dentistry. And we can do a lot of that at the moment. Um, using the patient's existing treat, um, tooth whitening tray, um, calling it a therapeutic tray, and delivering whitening gel, tooth mousse, MI paste, or um, soothing gel, such as proprietary soothes, such as the SDI Polar Soothe. Um, and the techniques we will be do talking about mainly is home bleaching, um, not power bleaching, um, combination bleaching sometimes. We, last week we spoke about non-vital bleaching, outside inside bleaching. There is a technique called um, enzymatic bleaching, which uses lactoperoxidase in combination with uh, carbamide peroxide. It's like a toothpaste. And again, brilliant for using it now. The company is called White Kin. It comes through um, Ireland, an excellent product to administer for your patients at the moment. We're not going to be talking about adjunctive techniques of microabrasion and resin infiltration. I did a webinar on that yesterday. You can look on my website, lindagreenwall.com, about that. So this is the basic um, realm of what we want to talk about today, combining whitening with patients who have um, extreme tooth wear or wear problems. And these are some of the cases that I've treated. I do a lot um, of treatment for patients in a minimal invasive way using this three-step technique for patients um, who have had um, tooth wear of many different types. Pro uh, Dr. Francesca Valletti, um, who invented the technique together with her colleagues uh, from the University of Switzerland, um, recommend the technique. And I'm going to go and run through it with you, how we combine it with tooth whitening techniques. Um, on this case here, patient was grinding her teeth. We opened up the bite using, uh, we did a, um, a wax up. We used stents, composite stents. We opened up the bite. Posteriorly, I worked on this patient. We opened on the lower teeth, 
And then once we were stable, uh, we did the whitening, the upper and lower whitening, and then we put palatal veneers, and then these are um, porcelain veneers over it. On this patient, he had a very deep class two bite and had worn through the enamel with erosive, he had gastroesophageal reflux. So that was the etiology, completely worn through. And um, we did the same, we did ortho for him. We built up his bite, we opened the vertical dimension, nearly four millimeters for him. We didn't prep anything on the front here. We did the tooth whitening while he was wearing the Invisalign tray. And then from the palatal here, you can see incisally, um, where we added length and the palatal uh, composites, it's um, um, a monoblock composite that we used. But again, no prep, opened him up, um, no breakages, a very simple, simple way. On this patient as well, she has a class 2 diff 2. Um, same thing, wax up. I'm going to run through the technique, but I just want to show you some before and after pictures straight away. Um, we did a wax up. She didn't want to have ortho on this patient. So we waxed up. We opened the vertical dimension, three millimeters using the lower, on the lower teeth mainly. She had some other issues on the upper teeth. And then when we completed, we, can, we opened up the vertical dimension, creating basically an anterior open bite. And then you restore with palatal veneers. And here, we did that here. And then I did bonding to improve that. But again, no, no prepping of the labial enamel. Whitening during, whitening before the treatment on this patient. This is Dr. Francesca Valletti, um, the three-step. Have a look on her Facebook group, which is the Three-Step Academy, and also on her website, Zero Donto, um, to understand in greater depth the technique. I have trained with her for the last eight years and being on her residential course in uh, a beautiful place, Annecy, to um, train with her. I've done this part in time. So um, really a really interesting technique, which I'd like to present with you today. Her first paper came out in 2007, describing the technique, the full mouth adhesive rehabilitation of a severely eroded dentition. Um, using this technique, which was absolutely revolutionary at the time. And when I saw her first lecture, which was 10 years ago, then I realized this is an amazing technique that we can introduce for our patients um, to do minimal invasive aesthetic dentistry without cutting. In the past, on a patient with extreme wear, we would have done um, full mouth rehabilitations where we cut at crowns, but now we are adding and we're doing additive dentistry. This is Dr. Francesca Valletti's she draws her own cartoons and basically restoring the occlusion by additive dentistry on lays, inlays, and also um, direct composite buildup. So this is the technique whereby you make the, your laboratory steps would be to do on a patient with wear, extreme wear, we make a maxillary wax up. Then you do the posterior occlusal wax up. She uses the gray wax so the patients can see and we can see. And then we'll do a maxillary palatal onlays, all the lab steps. From uh, step one, we would do assessment of the occlusal plane, creation of the posterior occlusion by increasing the vertical dimension, and that you can check with your wax up. And then you reestablish the anterior guidance, um, reestablish the anterior guidance, uh, recreating the palatal veneers, the maxillary palatal veneers or onlays. So here is the case that I was just showing you. What we do is the wax up first, and then we create the white bite where we open up and we create an anterior open bite. We create palatal veneers and buccal veneers if necessary. That is the basic technique. Again, this patient whitened first. Before we started any treatment, we did whitening first for her. She had previously had some composite, uh, composite uh, bonding veneers here which were always breaking. She was always breaking this over here because of her grinding and the bruxing. By opening up the bite, we were able to free the occlusion and we were able to get stable occlusion by opening up the occlusal vertical dimension and she has not broken these now. And it's really a very interesting technique. Again, new, new concept. And this is from Ultradent, from Optident and a Smile Italiano about whiteology what we are doing and working with is the world of whitening and 
um, whiteology is the concept that has been created to look at everything that is related to what we do with whitening. Obviously, first of all, photography and documentation, understanding the patient's um, requirements and the needs. And these days, all of this, uh, um, before we even start, we're doing Zoom consultations. I'm seriously loving the Zoom consultations because we can iron out a lot of problems and know how to prepare for the patient before they come in. Um, I do the Zoom consultations with my receptionist who's in one room, I'm in another room. The receptionist, I will go through and discuss with the patients um, their concerns. We'll go through the clinical situation of what to expect when they come and see us. Um, we will then explain the PPE and how they, what they will need to wear when they come to the surgery, the PPE requirements, how we will be dressed with our PPE requirements, and um, the receptionist or the practice manager would have done a COVID screening questionnaire. Uh, before the patient comes, they all patients fill in new medical histories now so that we have updated information. And um, what I would say after working today is Thursday, working for the last four days, a lot of patients did come down with COVID, which is really, we were in a global epidemic, particularly in North London, seriously, um, many, many patients have had this disease. Um, we also have found out from our patients now that we've been in lockdown after three months. Some patients that I had worked on previously had had the disease or we um, previously we had, um, they had just recovered from the disease and we did three hour crown preps and all those kind of things. Uh, another patient prepped a crown and the next day made a temporary, normal PPE made a temporary and um, canceled the fit appointment. And then we went into lockdown. She canceled the fit appointment because she had come down with COVID and um, she had caught it in Austria when she, came, when she went skiing and she'd come back three days before. I'm just saying, guys, this is a really interesting world that we're living in and things are different and we have to prepare for the new normal. But remember on our clinical techniques, we have, we have got a lot of techniques that we've done and do well and we can continue to do that. Um, and tooth whitening is a non-AGP procedure, so you can do those now. So we would do the photography and documentation. Um, and then you've got to cover your camera with all the loads of plastic so that you can actually cover it and protect it and everything's plastic. Um, please look at my Instagram. We've got lots of photos of how we are practicing now. Then we would undertake the tooth whitening and most of the tooth whitening techniques are home bleaching, starting by bleaching the upper teeth. We use 10% carbonite peroxide upper teeth first for two weeks, um, review the situation, and then we would bleed to the lower teeth. We always do the upper teeth because upper teeth whitening is quicker and less sensitive and the patients don't have, um, they've got a color comparison. And then of course you need good vis visualization. Um, sometimes now we can't use the air scaler and some of those prepping devices, um, matrix systems. These are, all, these are all the systems that we use in sculpting, bonding with whitening and building up. But now the first thing that we need to do, and while we're triaging, we are seeing triaging our patients with pain and sensitivity. We need to distinguish, does the patient have pain or do they have actually a palpitus? So we are asking all our patients these questions. Do you have any sensitivity to cold, to sweet? to heat or to pain on biting and sensitivity to cold. Um, the reason we ask about cold is we're um, asking about gingival recession or cervical erosion, um, cervical abrasion. So we're looking at that as well. Um, the sweet sensitivity is to do with tooth decay and with the tooth decay, does it matter on whitening? Not really, but we need to assess carefully. Um, the rules for assessing patients with whitening is that any discolored tooth needs a periapical radiograph because what we are looking at is whether there's any undiagnosed periapical lesions. That's really, really key. That's why we ask about heat. We want to know if the patients have had any um, undiagnosed periapical lesions um, that we need to assess and pain or, or to heat will mean there's a palpitus that we take seriously and root canals need to be done prior to doing any restorative or any whitening treatment because what could happen is you could the whole situation could flare up and you could get um, patient starts whitening they have an undiagnosed periapical lesion they start whitening three days later there's a major flare up and you've exacerbated where there was a previous anaerobic area into an aerobic area um, and when you do the root canal on a tooth like that, it's difficult to settle down because there's air, oxygen being pushed in to the anaerobic area. 
The next question we ask is pain on biting and sensitivity to cold. And the reason we do that is we want to evaluate for cracks. Patients who've got a cracked tooth syndrome need to be assessed carefully. Now, many patients who have extreme tooth wear or bruxing or um, occlusal problems, occlusal disharmony, they have a lot of cracked teeth. And when you do whitening, whitening goes into the weakest part of the tooth first, which is a crack. Many dentists and patients report that the most sensitive area when they do whitening is the lower incisal area. And that is where they've been grinding and bruxing on the lower incisors with tiny little micro cracks. So we need to understand what are we dealing with? Are we dealing with, um, are we dealing with pain and sensitivity or are we dealing with, um, what are we dealing with? So we want to look at um, etiology, abrasion and attrition erosion, acid to damage, dietary acid, regurgitation, eating disorders, we need to get detailed medical histories. Then we need to look at, for our patients, um, how are they brushing their teeth? Uh, are they using an electric toothbrush? Have they caused major abrasion from that? Do the teeth have micro cracks? Are the incisal edges cracked, and, um, chipped and cracked, upper and lower? <clears throat> Do they have multifactorial wear? Are they wearing occlusal splints? What diseases do they have, pulpitis? And asking about these questions is really key. Um, then, then we look at the pre-sensitivity assessment. Sometimes we would just start by doing assessment of etiology, do nothing, watch and monitor, modify toothbrushing techniques. And we would use the desensitizing toothpaste, which are the um, Novamin, arginine or durafat. So the Novamin is the Sensodyne toothpaste, the arginine is the toothpaste, um, the Colgate soothing toothpaste or durafat. What you can do for the patient is you can make the bleaching trays and give them the, place the soothing toothpaste into the trays. But for two weeks before whitening, what the patient would do is they would brush their teeth normally for to, um, with the desensitizing toothpaste to, re to reduce the sensitivity. Then we would make the bleaching tray, they would use desensitizing materials. The desensitizing materials of choice, there's three of them. It's Polar Soothe, it's Ultra Ease from um, Optident, or it is Relief Gel, and that's from Philips, and that contains ACP, fluoride, and potassium nitrate as well. Sometimes the main sensitivity areas where there's been abrasion is um, and recession, you want to do gingival grafting, but that is more extreme. Then we would do restorative treatments. We would monitor patients' toothbrushing habits, give them a softer toothbrush and just change the way they are brushing. Patients who got a lot of um, abrasion where they've been brushing really hard and have massive um, multiple class five lesions required, um, we would cover over the exposed dentine. You can use Bloom and Hyrosil. Hyrosil is one of my favorite products. I use it for all restorative. Um, it's enlightened sell it as well. It is a HEMA product and you basically, on the exposed area where it's sensitive, even now, excellent to use. You drip on five drops with it with a, a micro brush onto the exposed area that is sensitive and that will heal it. Um, sometimes on the exposed dentine, you may want to do a class five restoration. But my treatment of choice is a resin modified glass onoma restoration. And these days, the materials are so good, the resin modifies that they have beautiful shades, which blend in uh, beautifully at the cervical area. And we're using Reva, um, Reva or Fuji 2. For sensitivity, you can also look at silver diamine fluoride. In this era of non AGPs, um, SDF is an excellent um, material. Our paper is coming out in the BDJ on it tomorrow, so please search out for that. Um, and then later on, we'll be talking about on lays and in lays and how we'll be treating those. So patients with recession, what we would do is um, we would cover that over again, first monitoring, first starting with a bleaching tray using soothing gels before we continued any further treatment. Um, this kind of massive wear where the patient has been grinding, bruxing, breaking, um, and often all three etiologies are together. Same technique with this patient. We did a wax up, we opened up the bite, two millimeters upper, two millimeters lower, and we restored with palatal, uh, palatal veneers. Um, on her, we did small contouring as well. So we have a lot of minimal invasive treatments that we can provide for patients during this time. 
um, as we are getting back to work. So I've made a list. I'm not going to go into it. Take a photo of this and tag me on Instagram. But um, here is a list of our minimal invasive treatments. And these days, the way we are working, we're not cutting so much, but we are doing minimal invasive. So here, for example, typical patient. Patient has tetracycline discoloration. So she's got deep discoloration. She's got cervical erosion where she's been um, recession erosion in these areas, uh, abrasion as well, and um, chipped the teeth, broken the teeth. So the occlusal issues, she's got super thin gingiva over here. And in all these areas prior to whitening, we just covered over with A1 uh, glossoonoma or A2 Glossoonoma. Now, the, the difference between Fuji and Riva is Riva is more translucent. Riva's also got a bleach shade, which is brilliant for when you're trying to assess what shade to use. But all these areas over here, I would cover over, cover the whole thing, cover these all over, and you stop the sensitivity quite quickly. Then you would make a bleaching tray. So here we covered over, um, and then we made the, did the final restoration for this patient. So again, take a photo of the many. Um, reasons why there is dis why there is discoloration on the teeth. Um, many, many different reasons, again, a lot due to tooth wear erosion, medication, food that the patient is um, ingesting or eating. Chlo um, patients who swim a lot get chlorine discoloration from swimming pools. This, again, advanced tooth wear in multiple forms. Patients got no posterior teeth, complex situation. Not really, this is not really a bleaching case. But um, we need to look at how we're going to manage sensitivity all the way through whitening. And the way that would we do that, first of all, 85% of patients are sensitive during whitening. I don't know if you know that. And there's several reasons why. But the main reason is within five minutes, the bleaching gel goes into the nerve of every single tooth. Five to 10 minutes, it's inside every single tooth. So where you have exposed dentine such as this, this needs covering over. These are the products that we're using, using fluoride, potassium nitrate, ACP or combinations. Those are the products placed inside the patient's bleaching tray. We also do know that on the third day, it is most sense, the most sensitive. And the reason for that is we think there's maximum concentration of oxygen inside the nerve at the time. The way that the, these products work is that they block the penetration of the nerve. So potassium nitrate stops the excitability of the nerve. And the fluoride is a tubular blocker. So it blocks open, these um, open porous dentine tubules. And um, then we would also place the ACP, which is absorption of calcium phosphate, or to block the, the channels, the open dentine channels. Silver diamond fluoride, I don't know if any of you have used it, but excellent material, it's 38% silver diamond fluoride, two stages. Um, it's basically a liquid which crystallizes and can stop sensitivity, brilliant for tooth decay as well. Um, complex situation, periodontal issues, all kinds of issues going on, but patient has major sensitivity. Um, also because of perio and all kinds of things. So the sensitivity takes precedence to everything else. But once the perio is stable and the sensitivity needs to be treated with a bleaching tray with soothing gels inside. We, what we are talking about is the penetration through of the whitening gel through the tooth and how we manage. Whether we're dealing with abrasion, abfraction or erosion, slightly different techniques. But on these, these areas here, at the moment we're using resin modified glass onoma for those because they have a beautiful, um, beautiful aesthetics, actually, ladies and gentlemen, once the teeth are treated, you can't even see that there is any, um, you can't see the join, you can't see that the treatment has been done because it blends in so well. So the technique that we would use is we would clean the cervical area, it's pumice and hippie scrub normally, not using sandblasting at the moment or the aquacare machine because of generation of aerosols. So we're very low on that. Pumice and heavy scrub, fine. Then I would take a probe and I probe into the class five area. And I check that the, all the plaque is gone. Often you need to go back and clean with pumice and heavy scrub. Then you would isolate if you want in the isolation rubber dam as then, as you know, recommendation for rubber dam at the moment. The retraction we use, we would place, we cut a six millimeter length of retraction cord um, and retract back because often the gingiva is pushing into the cervical abrasion area. 
and check that the cavity is clean before you do this. And when you etch, you double etch. So you etch, check it again and double etch to make sure because we're dealing often with sclerotic dentine, may not etch as well. The next procedure after etching would be placing the hurry seal. We would hurry seal, we put five drips on, gently air dryer, and then we would place resin modified glass on them. I scallop it in a special way with a probe and a brush. And then I dip in my brush um, into bonding agent and sculpt the class five in the, um, sculpt the class five with the resin modified glass on them. So let's look at this. So this is a typical lesion that we are talking about. Deep, actually, can you see where the, where the retraction cord is? When you actually retract, I have to actually get the boys to stop. I'm, I'm at home at the moment with my four boys. So it is a little bit noisy and I have to tell them to shut up in a minute. But anyway, um, here is the retraction cord over here. And you can see when you actually retract back, you push the gingiva away, the gingiva has grown into the, um, into the cervical area. So you need to retract back. And sometimes we can retract with uh, two cords. We push back and you see, actually, this is a really large lesion we're dealing with. So we would etch this, etch a double etch, agitate all the way around, etch all the way up to here, then hurry seal, then I would place resin modified glass on it, and I would sculpt it with a brush dipped in bond. Sculpt it all the way down, take a probe, and probe around here, and then light cure. This is the final results. Both of those done, very simple. Um, but uh, very effective. So here we would uh, treat all these patients like this. These are the indications for whitening in general, stains, antibiotic as we discussed, patients who smoke. And then let's say a patient has had a crown. If you want to know about doing more whitening and you say to the patient, if you're about to start restorative, Mrs. Jones, in the next five years, were you planning on doing whitening or having whitening because we're about to change a crown um, on your front tooth and after that we can't change a color. So if you're considering that, think about that now. Contraindications for whitening, we say pregnant or lactating women. We used to say deep surface fracture lines like here. You can't whiten out this crack from smoking. So that's not. Patients with sensitive teeth, we used to say that was no, but um, now we know how to deal with that. Excessive restorative work patients, again now, it's not a contraindication. Allergies, yes, allergies are very rare. We spoke last time about under 18 whitening, severe fluorosis, um, but most of the time we can deal with it. So the process of the whitening is an oxidization process where the hydrogen peroxide breaks down into oxygen and water. It's the oxygen which gets inside the tooth. So take a photo of this. This is the, um, some of the products that are available on the UK market. And why do we prefer uh, carbamide peroxide as opposed to hydrogen peroxide. The reason we prefer carbamide is carbamide releases urea. Re urea is an excellent wound healer and urea elevates the pH in the mouth. So it's really good for root decay, tooth decay and healing the mouth, particularly at this time. So there is an Novon mild, which is 5% um, carbamide peroxide and 10% is the basic, ingredient, basic one, 10%. Carbamide peroxide is equivalent to 3% hydrogen peroxide. So this would be very useful for, for patients, elderly patients, patients with extreme sensitivity, or patients who a, ch a, ch a child patient, patients who are immunocompromised. Again, brilliant product for that. 10% carbamide peroxide, these are the standard products. And most of the time we would start widening at 10% carbamide peroxide. 15% carbamide peroxide is that we would use for root canals and for patients where we have to do tetracycline for a long period of time, we start them on 10 and then we'd go to 15. Here is our article which we published on carbamide peroxide and the use in oral hygiene and health. So the other benefit about carbamide peroxide is that it's really beneficial um, because it contains an ingredient called carbapol. Carbapol is a slow release oxygen agent and all the way through the night, it continues to release oxygen, which is why it's effective for 10 hours over the nighttime period. That's why it's called a nighttime product. If you're using a hydrogen peroxide only, hydrogen peroxide, all the, um, like a day product, all the oxygen is released within half an hour. 
to 45 minutes. So it has no more effectiveness than using it for longer. That is the difference between carbamide and hydrogen peroxide. And that is why I prefer to use carbamide peroxide as a, instead of hydrogen peroxide only. Hydrogen peroxide products, again, very good for topping up. If the patient has previously widened their teeth and they want to top up, that's absolutely fine. So again, we would do single tooth whitening. We would whiten just um, the dark tooth first, making a segmental bleaching tray. We would take the patient's bleaching tray and we would, you see here is the dark tooth. We would cut um, this part of the bleaching tray here and here to cut back like that. Um, and we would bleach the dark tooth first. So we lighten that. If you bleach everything on a case like that, you will get um, these two teeth lightening and this tooth not lightening enough. Due to the dentine structure, this tooth will take much, much longer, can take four to six weeks to get the shade to match the others. That's why we make a segmental bleaching tray. And we have published on that. Um, the publication came out last year. So please have a look at that. It's 10 pages in the BDJ. We also published on the over-the-counter whitening products, very controversial with all the issues. Um, and we, our score was 929 on the altmetrics. They also want to see these days what your social media score is and how the media take up the article. And this obviously was very popular. What we found is a lot of these over-the-counter whitening products are salts. They're basically salts and some of them bicarb. But what we found with these products is most of them are salt and cause um, erosion on the teeth. We have great concerns about it. They're er eroding away the enamel surface. And so they, again, they should, any product that is supplied in the UK market should show product safety, uh, show that they are safe and they are not safe. So the patients may say, well, at sour grapes, we can buy this for 10 pounds or 20 pounds in our local supermarket and your, your treatment is 500 pounds. It's a completely different ball game and put different, we are doing different treatments. But especially the dentist supplied products are therapeutic and especially during this time is brilliant. We won't have time to talk about under 18 whitening, but suffice it to say, if the patient has a disease, then absolutely appropriate to do whitening for the patient under 18 and we've listed that. Now let's look at dental examination for whitening and tooth wear to exclude pathology. The rule and the legislation on providing whitening treatment is all each dentist must exclude pathology and do an examination to exclude pathology. And that again for the uh, tooth wear. These days we have to do the Smith and Knight index and monitor the BWE index on a patient. And patients have to be told that they have tooth wear. Again, they say, oh, nobody told me that I had tooth wear. If I only knew, I would do X, Y, and Z. And that's why we need to look at etiology. But our clinical examination, take a photo of the slide medical history, dental history, patients' hopes and aspirations, the social history. Actually, the social history is really important during COVID now to find out if they're isolating or with their family members, family members, whether or not they've had COVID or not COVID. Um, very, very important to get the social history. In the diet, we want to know about their consumption of fizzy drinks, uh, diet cokes, those, those kind of acidic drinks. We, we use this Vita Easy Shade, which is excellent for assessing shades. And every patient has a shade assessment to know. And it's a good idea to ask their patients to get into the habit of saying, do you know your shade? Um, to have a discussion about that. And we mentioned we're looking for bruxing. And we're looking at the signs of wear on the teeth. And then we're doing special tests, radiology and um, vitality, et cetera, and measuring erosion and tooth wear. This is the brilliant, uh, brilliant piece of kit. This is the Vita Easy Shade. There is a, um, an app which you can download called the Vita Assist, and the Vita Easy Shade works together where you can Bluetooth the shade onto the patient's notes on the computer. And here we are measuring 1M1 together with A1, and it will stop us having shade mismatches. Brilliant piece of kit, have a look at that. So we're looking at many different factors when we're looking at tooth wear, a physiological versus pathological, and is it a functional problem and what is the situation? And we're looking at what, whether it's a single etiology, multiple etiology, common etiologies, the erosion factors, the amount of acidic fruits and vegetables and drinks that patients um, are eating the heartburn and miprazole, whether they're taking those kind of meditation, me medications, 
patients at the moment, ladies and gentlemen, during COVID, they are grinding like crazy and making bite plates is absolutely essential. We're doing digital bite plates and scanning our patients. The digital designs are so much easier to tolerate, to wear, and so we're loving the bite plates um, and making tons of them. Obviously, the symptoms which we, and those symptoms can be diagnosed on Zoom calls, which is also very awesome, and we don't have to have face-to-face -face contact until we actually need to scan the patient. So that's another good thing. The symptoms of the grinding, the jaw pain, and the muscle issues are with them, um, TMJ, muscular pains, etc. But um, simply, we would be treating that with bite plates as a start. This patient has gastroesophageal reflux, has had that for 25 years, plus psoriasis. And so it's quite a complex medical history. You can see the mega erosion. We're not going to talk about the wisdom tooth, but the mega erosion that he has. These are, this is the appearance of his teeth. He's not happy with appearance. Uh, he had veneers replaced on these tooth. This veneer broke after a week and he's not happy or there's just too much discoloration. And he wanted to see, he said to me, if you can do anything that can help with, um, with simple minimal invasive treatment and you don't have to drill, I'm there. If you look at the photos, you can see massive erosion, here massive uh, tooth surface loss, palatally, um, occlusally, here the occlusal amalgam is high, um, early decay, a massive wear problem. Here are the records, these are the intraoral camera shots, very, very severe. Um, if there's still decay around the previous amalgams, and he's got these massive class 5 lesions. So on these class 5 lesions, very simply, we quickly restore those with the resin-modified gloss on them. Sort that out. Here are his study models um, where we assess it. You can see mega erosion. And so we did a wax up, did a palatal wax up, um, occlusal wax ups over here. And we looked at um, improving aesthetics, buckley, um, occlusion palatally, and building up. So we made these kind of stents which we can use. They can be used for veneers, they can be used for occlusal wax ups, but we design our stents in a different way now. Here, so here is the wax up we did for him. We built up here, over here, and then over this, we make a stent. And I'm going to show you some videos of the stent here. So this is the type of stent that we use now. We take those, those blue disposable trays with the little holes and we make a clear one like this. This is the putty. So now this is, this is a duplicate of the wax up. Here is the putty that we place. And we're now going to fill this like this. Let me see if the video is going to work. We would use the Elite Transparent and we would place it in a clear tray and we make the quadrant models for the stent. We like to have a hard stent because if you're using a soft, soft stent, when you put the composite on, it all squidges out. So here, this is helping us to prepare the stent. And the putty is held as a stopper, so we've got enough space to make our stents. And that we'd let, we leave that to set, and then we cut that back. Set the timer. It needs to be, I think, for three minutes. Let me set the tongue on it, but this is the Elite Transparent. Um, and so that's what we did for him. We made the stents. Here we are directly. So we've done the class five restorations first. We made the clusal stents cover over. We would normally do in one, um, in about a two hour session, we do whole quadrant um, and we would do one, one arch, uh, the lower or the upper you decide, depending on your assessment. Today, we've got a very short time to talk. So I just wanted to show you the technique and explain how we do this. So in the stand, we put the composite here and we stamp it and we hold it and we light gear through. Here is his final results. So we did composite bonding. Then what we did here is we did ortho. We brought this tooth forward, a little bit of interproximal reduction, brought this forward. He had an anterior open bite by opening up the occlusal or vertical dimension, two millimeters upper, two millimeters lower. Here is the final result. Here is his ortho, where we brought this forward. Here, like this. Here are the palatal veneers. The palatal veneers were next. Now, when you do palatal veneers, and I'm not sure how many in the audience are doing them, they are tricky to do because they can move. 
they've got no retention grid so we put these little stoppers on and they're difficult to cement we put the little stoppers on anteriorly and we just cut these off afterwards so here we are placing them into proximally uh, we've wedged through we've got the obturgate on we've got the um, interproximal um, acetate sheets in between now when you are doing this interestingly we don't um, we don't have to prep because the patients prepped it themselves with the acid erosion and we are here we've etched you can see where the enamel is the exposed dentine etc but we prep um, we don't prep we just tidy up and we take an impression so here we've worked over that old amalgam we put the composite one directly over and you create the white bite this is the technique called the white bite where you open the vertical dimension and you do that again in two hours you do the whole lower now let's look here he's talking after treatment so what he's done what we did here is that we um he's in composite on the lower and when we brought that tooth forward we stabilized him and once we had stabilized him then we did the whitening so we did palatal veneers and now the buccal veneers he didn't want shade uh massive B, uh, b1 plus 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 he wanted natural and here he is like that so we took him from here to here the whitening was done at this time once he was stable once we had sorted out the, the sensitivity um, and we did the glass onomous built him up here then we did the whitening here and i call this the white t-shirt effect patients love the whitening and they tend to do things to enhance the white effect here he's got his white t-shirt on and then so we took him from here to here to here and here he has the palatal veneers the buccal veneers and the posteriorly he's all in composite with a very nice thick bite plate protecting everything nothing is broken nothing is debonded which is pretty awesome and that's how it looks so here are the palatal veneers here is the join over here here is the join there the palatal veneers the buccal veneers and the palatal veneers but nice aesthetics and no prepping so that's in there from there to there what do you think guys then when we had the palatal veneers on took off these old composites we took this all off and we did he said i'm happy for you to do veneers on but you're not allowed to prep so there was no prepping here it was just cleaning no prepping on any of these teeth and here are the veneers these are the emax veneers the palatal uh, composites are made out of uh, you can use enamic which is a combination of porcelain enamel or you can use a CAD cam in a CAD cam composite to go from there to there I think that's a good improvement minimum invasive no cutting perfect for non-AGP at this time just say and here it is in the bite plate and checking the occlusion and he's been like this now for five years porcelain inlays and onlays today not enough time to talk we can do that another time but we are using if we are going to then go to the next stage which is to put them into the porcelain and uh, in, into onlays and veneers or onlays we would use emax uh, emax and pmma these are the different materials for the onlays a lot of new stuff coming out and again with cad cam brilliant to use the brilliant most of the time we're using the vt dynamic so they're nice and strong you've got the combination of both techniques um, for, particularly for patients who are grinding the onlay designs the onlays you don't have to prep them because of the fact that we're going to open the vertical dimension everything would have been tested first using um, the composite as the occlusal vertical dimension so that tells us whether we're going to be stable or not and this is just the techniques which we can discuss another time because there's not very much time today showing you what we use for the palatal veneers and there's the namic which is very popular to make it in cad cam so now let's show you another technique where we did three-step technique he got his oral hygiene sorted out then we did the whitening and then we did the the bonding so this is a patient who drinks a lot of diet coke this is the result as a university lecturer and he is grinding away quite a lot um, 
and B has massive erosion. So priority number one is sought out the oral health and the gum, the gum inflammation, etc. First of all, hygiene sessions, three sessions with a hygienist, modifying the toothbrushing technique, and this is the Diet Coke staining. And so once we had done that, we um, whitened his teeth, then we opened up the bite. Here is the stent being placed. Uh, we put the composite into the stent and we stamped the, the stent in place, holding it very tightly. I like to use really light enamels or the bleaching enamels, but because we're working on the clusal surface, I use um, either Essential Light, the new Ecosite. Um, all of them have beautiful bleaching composites. So we put the lightest shade that, um, onto the clusal surfaces, pack it tightly down with your plugger, pack, pack really hard. You would etch and bond the tooth, and um, then you would, here is the stent in place. What I do when I put the stent on, um, and it needs to be really rigid, I mark with a Sharpies marker here exactly where we are in place before I put that on. So we took him from here, oral health, getting the oral hygiene sorted out, whitening. First whitening the upper teeth, then the lower teeth. Now you would think that he had would have a lot of sensitivity during whitening with this amount of erosion. And ladies and gentlemen, I'll just tell you that there was very, very little, which is why in the past we would have said, do not even think of whitening this case. But actually, quite a simple case. First the upper, then the lower. Look at the improvement in his oral health during this time. And so at the stage, we also discussed with him whether he wanted to close the diastomus. He wasn't sure. We did mock-ups to show him. He went home to show his wife to see whether she liked it. But we were able to close the diastomus using palatal veneers. And that, I think, was pretty exciting that we can do that, again, in a minimal invasive way. So what we did here, same again, we opened up the vertical dimension um, using the white by technique in the stents with the enamel shade um, composites or the bleach shade composites on top of these areas. We even bonded over the crown. Can you see here? We On this crown, we just um, porcelain etch, silane bond and bonded directly over very minimal invasive technique. And we use this a lot in our um, stages of building up occlusional patients with complex restorative issues. We bond straight over and open up here. Here's the composite. Open him up all the way like that. And for him, only palatal veneers. No buccal veneers. Can you see how we've managed to close the diastema from here to here? And this is how it looks now. So oral health, whitening first, get everything whitened. And then we went on here is the open a vertical dimension. We open four, five, six. We leave the seven open so that with no restoration, so we can see that we are stable with our clusal vertical dimension. We go four, five, six, creating the white bite over here. Once we'd had the anterior open bite, bring the patient back. We assess has any of this broken? Is anything destable? Is the patient comfortable? Because we've got to get the patient used to having the clusal vertical dimension. You go, patient won't tolerate it. You know when you do one filling and the patient keeps telling you it's high, it's high, it's high. This is totally different when we're opening up the whole um, arch. So we've opened him up here, opened up here, leave the anterior open bite for two weeks, bring the patient back, review, is this broken? Next question, how do you separate here? So you can separate with the um, PTFE in between, interproximally, or sometimes, if depending, we can actually just bond it all in place for the time being, and later on we cut back. So there's many different ways to do that. Or you can place separators, little matrix, sectional matrices here before you stamp on the um, composite. But very simple techniques, no prepping, nothing, nothing was prepped, nothing was cut, only additive. So this is a mirror image, but here we were from here, to here, there's that, that is the crown. That's the crown there, bonded directly onto the, here, bonded directly onto the crown. 
and bond it right over. You can bond over the amalgams, you can remove them if you want, you can bond it, but bonding on no cutting whatsoever. The only cutting would be to smooth any rough edges. Perfect technique for this era now where we are concentrating on doing non-AGPs. This is the amount of erosion that he had. When I trained to do my MSC at Guys, we were taught to do crown lengthening, bone removal, and prep crowns on these. And now it's completely different where we have the opportunity to bond and to do no prep, no prep and adding with the composites like that. So here we are, this was a different type of stent, a little bit thinner, I prefer the thick ones, and we bond on, here it is, checking straight away where we are from here to here. Now, sometimes palatal veneers can be quite tricky to do. And so just like label veneers, they don't, they're all fine and then you fit one and then it doesn't fit. So we take a red um, articulating paper and we mark into approximately where it's rocking and we adjust this prior to cementing. As I said, it's quite tricky. But here, luckily he's got the astomers etching. Here you can see where the dentine is exposed, the enamel is, um, very little enamel in a shell-shaped enamel. We are light curing it. Now, how are we doing this? He's got the obturgate on. We are etching from the palatal, and here we're bonding palate here. Here are the two central, the central ones. They're the palatal veneers on in place. Then we go on to the laterals. There's the lateral. There we're adding on, closing the diastomas at the same time. And here we've added on from the palatal, the canine here, to close these diastomas. So I wanted to show you a simple technique that um, is minimal invasive using the white. And look how much nicer the enamel looks now that we have been able to whiten that. Now, when you design the palatal veneers, you don't want to have heavy, um, deep occlusion and deep anatomy on these. You want the patient, because you're creating an anterior open bite and you open up the bite, you want to give the patient freedom of movement. They want to be able to move in all the excursions on a bruxing kind of patient. They need to have flatter palatal surfaces. So that is the exact design that you want. You don't want complex palatal anatomy for the patient to get stuck. Um, a lot of discussion and research on this technique and the effectiveness on this technique. You may ask about the difference in using um, the dial technique and what is the difference. We used to do that technique and let everything, so you open anteriorly, um, you place the palatal veneers anteriorly and then you let everything over erupt. I find it's easier to manage it the other way around. So here is the final result on this patient. And again, no debonds because we opened up the occlusal OVD. And I wanted to show you how simple it can be to create this um, kind of look. We looked at which, air, which patients actually, which are the patients who had the most erosion. And this was a study that was conducted and um, sponsored by um, Sensodyne. And they looked at who has the NCCLs. This is the buzzword at the moment, non carous cervical lesions. And um, under 18, there was quite a lot, but actually the main 18 to 25 is some evidence of the erosion. The most erosion is the 25 to 36, uh, 35 year old, 26 to 35, most erosion and more dentine sensitivity. This is the category exactly that want to whiten their teeth, which means they will need soothing toothpaste, they will need management, they'll need early intervention. And what Francesca Valletti says is don't wait do not wait, um, start early. Because of the additive technique, you can do the whitening, you can add the composite. Don't wait till it is so severe. Get started because it is a minimal invasive way. And um, because we've got five minutes, I'm going to stop now, stop sharing the screen, Louise, and I'm gonna answer the questions. I just wanted to give you a little taster today. So here we go with the questions. Can you let us know what the best lab design is for the tray. So you're talking about the bleaching tray. The bleaching tray should be a tight fitting, tight fitting tray, scalloped and no, um, shall I stop sharing my screen first? I think I'll, um, let me just move this. I'll stop sharing the screen and, yeah. um, okay. 
Right, so the question about the bleaching tray design. The bleaching tray design should be scalloped, non-reservoirs, you want it really tight fit. It should go from the eight to the eight, um, half a millimeter over the gingival area, lingually and buccally scalloped. So here is a question from Richard. And Richard, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. When using the AquaCare unit, do we clean cervical lesions, what tips? We use the tiniest tips that we can um, and we try not to, good, um, to cause a tra trauma on the gingiva. So mainly in the eroded area. Um, I like to use the silk the most. Silk is a Novomin product. It's a brilliant soother and a cleaner. Absolutely brilliant. And um, we use it on all treatments. At the moment, we're not using the AquaCare because of the not creating aerosols. But very soon when the pandemic has died down and um, the virus has been eliminated completely from the UK, we will be back um, using more of our techniques. And the same with the AGPs, we are fully heavily gowned out with everything and undertaking treatment on patients, um, triaging this week, but back to restorative next week. Uh, next question from Shada. When do you use resin modified glass or enema? Um, and when do you use composite? So here's the thing, I actually prefer to do, um, Shada, I prefer to do resin modified glass or enema. I'll tell you why. Number one, it's pretty easy. Number two, you don't get those black staining marks. You know where the composites leak? They can see the join between the enamel and the composite. They don't do that with resin modified glass or enemas. And um, the, the, the um, products are so improved that um, they're beautiful. Aesthetics is beautiful. It's very quick because when a patient has got a class five lesion, it's not just one, it's the whole quadrant. So we're doing quadrant um, class five lesions with glossa onomas, quadrant by quadrant. And I think, why do we leave this? What are we waiting for? We're gonna wait for it to get worse. It's already bad. Just get on and clean it and bond it, um, clean it and place the GIT straight away, then make the bleaching trays. Um, question from Richard Greenhill. Thank you for your question. How do you isolate the posters for composite bonding? when using your splint. Where is the question, Richard? How do you isolate the posters for composite bonding when using your splint? Do you mean, aha, uh -huh, do you mean your stent when we are um, doing the stent? Is, I think that's what you mean. I'm not really sure, but um, the way that I like to work is um, put on the octogate um, and we check that the stent is, is fitting nicely. I mark it exactly where it uh, needs to fit. So this the stents normally for the to place the composite mock-ups. The the stents normally go extended to the lateral. I take a pen and I mark with a sharpie exactly where the stent is. So for example, we mentioned that we don't bond the number seven, the second molars. Um, I will not the, the stent. Um, I don't place the composite there. If there is any excess or flash, I will use a um, flame shaped burr and flame around and floss that through. But you can also put PTFE around that tube so that it's not bonded. And we put the PTFE in between. And I hope that, um, I hope Richard, that answers your question. But any questions that we can't answer, because I'm watching the time, we've got one more minute. Any questions that I can't answer, please message me on, the, um, on my Instagram, Greenwall Dental, and I'm happy to answer more questions. So now, a question from Dr. Aishwara. Doesn't non-prep increase the vertical dimension? Doesn't non-prep increase the, the dimension of the anteriors? So what you're saying is, doesn't it make it thick and bulky? Actually, a lot of the time, um, it gives more lip support. So it doesn't really make it that much more. We can make Emax veneers very thin so that it's not normally a problem. The patients really are excited that they don't have to have their teeth cut down, prepped for standard veneers these days. And they would rather, uh, they understand that um, rather no prep and keep the enamel because the enamel is the best to use. Um, and again, you check it with a wax up. You can do a mock up and check and show the patient and let the patient see and talk and they can go home with the mock up as well. And um, Caitlin, there's a question from you. Um, when bleaching single discolored central incisor before doing full mouth, where is the question? Here it is. Um, when bleaching sing single discolored tooth before doing full mouth bleaching, we will make a second tray, yes. So the treatment plan for a patient with a single dark tooth is two upper, let's say it's the upper, two bleaching trays on the upper, one bleaching tray on the lower. We never just bleach one tooth. It doesn't work because you don't know what shade 
the tooth is going to bleach to, particularly with a non-vital tooth. You can't guarantee where it's going to bleach and where, you know, what is the outcome. So we rather commit when we're doing one single tooth, we rather actually get bleach everything. First the dark tooth, then the upper. We bleach the whole upper, so you've got a beautiful blend of white shade, and then we would bleach the lower. Mirel. Um, she mentions about stains not usually being seen in erosive teeth. We actually see patients with poor oral hygiene, um, they stain inside the erosive areas, some yes, some no. But you'd be surprised how much plaque is on the teeth. And that is why we need to really clean before doing any bonding. That's why we like the pumice and heavy scrub and the aquacane normally because we are able to clean. You need to clean so much before we do the composite bonding and the adhesive techniques. Um, what I use to bond veneers, the normal veneer cement. Uh, okay, here's a question. After root canal, after we've done root canal, how long do we wait if the patient's got a periapical lesion before whitening? So we would do that. We would normally wait a month for everything to settle down, depending on the size of the radiolucency. If it was a really large radiolucency, we wait, may wait three months, take a new radiograph, see that. Um, it was starting to heal before we start doing non-vital bleaching straight away. So we want to, to make sure that it's completely asymptomatic. And um, how do you feel about, Nicola's asking about whitening varnishes. You know, Nicola, it's a really great starter. If that's motivating the patient to, the, a, a varnish, the new whitening varnishes will give you one or two shades lighter. It's not going to be significant changes, but it's a good starter as an entry level. Um, consent form for whitening, please email me and um, for, if you want any of the consent forms or any of our handouts. We have sent them to Tipton, so they are around. Um, do we restore where there's only, this is the last question because I know people are rushing back, um, but I'm going to answer two more questions. Um, do you restore where there's only anterior when? No, we restore for posterior as well and sometimes you don't need to, but you need to assess the, the, the wear and make decisions about that, but don't leave it. The main thing is the patients need to be um, informed and educated of the situation, the dietary factors the, um, before we decide on how we're going to do it. But the beauty about this technique that I was showing you today, I wanted to be able to technique it. If they break a little bit of the composite where we've added in the clues or vertical dimension, you just add some more. Francesca Valletti says, patients pay for the repairs. You can do the treatment, the patient pays for the repairs, that's what they need to know. And the beauty of biocomposite, you just add some more. Um, if the patient is not managing and wearing the composites down, you can go on to the next phase, phase which is the, um, the porcelain on lace. But you can decide when you do that. This is Maggie. Hi, Maggie. Um, do you give a warranty period for the paterfineers? Well, it's like all restorative dentistry. We normally say that um, we recover things for the first year. It depends on what the situation is. If the patient is damaging by putting pens in their mouth and levering pens uh, and fracturing, if they're eating toffees and um, you know that kind of stuff, then, then um, we would discuss that. And in general, they don't actually break. It's really interesting because you've opened up the vertical dimension, you've reduced the forces, the deep forces, they don't actually break and they don't actually debond and all patients have a splint to wear afterwards. So you can decide on the warranty period, but it's normally a year um, when you decide on the situation for the patient. Again, with complaints, we want to eliminate complaints. We want to understand patients' problems, um, commiserate, understand, and do what you need to do to sort out the, the patient's complaint as quick as possible. And if it means you've got to replace one palatal veneer free of charge, then just go for it because the amount of stress with the litigation is not worth it. Um, so Nicola's re referring to the, the, the style, that's fine. So here is a good question and we'll stop now um, after this one. Um, and Louise, you'll save these questions and we can answer some more. And um, would you provide bleaching and composite for a patient who's actively binge drinking, active gourd, or what about patients with bulimia? So yes, we would, bleaching and composite because it's such a simple treatment to do, it's non-invasive um, and it's better than no treatment where they're constantly 
um, constantly causing the acid erosion. So the, the, we mentioned the bleaching has a therapeutic effect to help the gingiva heal the mouth, um, elevate the pH. So yes, we would do that. The bonding, sometimes the bonding on the cirrhosis uh, dentine is difficult and you need to double etch and double bond. But yes, I would be doing that. Some patients with gourd, it's difficult to diagnose, that medication is difficult, etc. But I would do simple treatment for them. So I'm going to say thank you very much. I hope that was useful to everybody. And um, there is a lot more information on that, but um, just no time today. But please, um, we will be doing more webinars. So do um, I'm doing one for the BDA soon. Um, so just please keep tuning in. And thank you so much to Tipton Seminars for um, the invitation and for allowing us to give the presentation today. Thank you so much. And I hope, um, hope you're all safe and well. Keep enjoying your dentistry and do what you love the most. So thanks so much, everybody. And best wishes. Thank you.